right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to a workshop in the afternoon. I'm pretty sure that all of you are quite tired at this point already, but I think it's um, worth sticking around. Can you all hear me quite well? Very good. Um, our workshop today is going to be on the question whether we're moving towards a decentralized Internet constitution. Um, and the theme of today is to try to explore two different trends that we have um, experienced over the last couple of years. The one is the emergence of blockchain technology as decentralized um, crypto technology. And um, the other trend is that of the constitutionalization of the Internet, described very often as um, digital constitutionalism, the idea that um, there is a consensus forming around norms about rights and principles for the Internet. Um, and we have today um, people uh, here in the room and also here on the panel who can uh, show us a little bit about both views, uh, both topics. Um, we'd like to discuss the intersection of those two topics. So on the one hand, we see um, kind of a fragmentation of digital constitutionalism globally, where on national and on regional level, um, laws are being made and uh, norms are being formed around how the Internet should be governed, what kind of rights and principles should exist on the Internet. And on the other hand, we have this um, ubiquitous uh, mega trend. Uh, a lot of um, people now um, thinking and investing into blockchain technology, both in uh, a private and public blockchains, and um, we'll talk about those two things. Our speakers today um, have very diverse interests, and I'm pretty sure that all of you have the same diversity of interests. And so we try to um, get as much time as possible to um, discuss those two issues. Um, the first part is going to be a presentation by each of our speakers for about five to six minutes. Um, the second part is going to give you the opportunity to make your comments, ask your questions. We'll also have uh, relate to our remote participants and hopefully get uh, some interaction there. Um, so if you can hear us now remotely, please do think about questions for the second part. Um, and the third um, part is going to be about uh, reactions by your speakers to each other uh, and um, to you and to your questions and comments. Now, uh, before I give the word to the speakers, uh, I'd like to introduce them quickly. Um, we have uh, on the very uh, left of me and the right of you, Lisa Garcia, who is with the Foundation of Media Alternatives in the Philippines, who fights for um, internet rights. Then we got Primavera de Filippi here of uh, CNRS here in Paris and um, a faculty associate of the Berkman Klein Center, um, who thinks and creates in the field of blockchain technology. Uh, Nicholas Susor, um, over there, um, from the Queensland University of Technology, um, who conducts research in the field of digital constitutionalism and um, human rights online, particularly with um, perspective of two platforms. We got Andrea Becali uh, from ICANN, who will uh, provide us a perspective of ICANN uh, regarding the topic of human rights. And, and later on, uh, Gui Berger will join us uh, from UNESCO, who will also tell, talk a little bit about his perspective. Um, but he's currently at a other panel or presentation of the Internet Universality Indicators. All right. Um, please, Lisa, do you want to start? Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so, as, as Dennis mentioned, I work in the Philippines uh, f for a non-government organization, and for the last several years, we've been looking into the intersection of human rights and ICTs. So there's no doubt that over the past decades, we know that how digital technology has tr transformed our lives and we now enjoy a lot of unprecedent, unprecedented possibilities to exercise our rights online. But at the same time, there are threats uh, current and emerging in, in the internet. So how do we protect such rights and freedoms on the net? So in the Philippines, what we have done is that we came up in 2015 um, together with different um, organizations, we had a multi-stakeholder holder forum, which we did in, in 2015. Um, and uh, what, uh, what we did was to, um, uh, to get inputs from the different stakeholders and develop a draft of 
a Philippine Declaration of Internet Rights and Principles. Uh, uh, this initiative was, of course, inspired by many similar um, initiatives of a global and national scope. So we would have that from Brazil, from Africa, the one that was developed by the APC on the internet rights and principles. So, so during the, the process is that when we had the forum, we also had some mini workshops within the forum. And what we did was to discuss issues that were heavily impacted by, by uh, ICT's issues such as privacy, the digital economy, um, gender, freedom of expression, etc. And the results of the discussions were fed to a team, a drafting team, consisting of individuals from different organizations of diverse backgrounds. Uh, and, and they were tasked to develop the content of the declaration that we developed. We also, what we did was to also to hold um, consultations in the different provinces in the Philippines as well as to solicit inputs online so it was uh, there were also some um, suggestions coming from individuals belonging to different groups uh, through online because we published it and then when we came up with a uh, with a declaration we, we called it the philippine um, declaration on internet rights and principles we focused on 10 areas that we think should be um, uh, that that we things that we value like internet access for all uh, and then there's the section on democratizing the architecture of the internet, which speaks about openness, freedom of expression and association, the right to privacy and protection of personal data, gender equality, openness and access of, uh, to information, knowledge and culture, uh, the socioeconomic empowerment and innovation, which talks about the digital economy, education and digital literacy, um, liberty, safety and security of the internet, as well as uh, ICTs for environmental sustainability. Now, um, this declaration is, of course, uh, we perceived it as the reflection of the dreams, the hopes, and aspirations of Filipinos of what a Philippine internet should be. And we, we thought that th this is something that can serve as a basis for public education, advocacy, networking, and campaigns on um, ICTs, human rights, and development. We launched it in November of 2015 at the office of the then Department of ICT and we had 23 civil society organizations that signed the declaration. No government organization signed it because uh, it would take a lot of uh, time to, to draft a memorandum of agreement with them but but we knew that uh, some, some government organizations were supportive of this and then to this day we have been, we, we still um, um, uh, spread the word about the existence of such a declaration uh, through our networks in the Philippines. And then I would also, I would also like to talk to you about this um, um, principle that we developed with um, another group. And this is with uh, women's rights uh, advocates, with sexual rights advocates, uh, internet rights advocates. And I'm talking about the feminist principles of the internet. So some of you may, might have heard it. It was something that was developed by the Association for Progressive Communications. And if you wish, there's a copy of the principle here in front, both in English and in French. So um, uh, we know that the internet is a space for empowerment and it is a space where we can express ourselves. It's also a space for resistance, for building movements. It is something that should work for all of us, for women and queer persons alike. So given the chance um, for, for feminists to create our own internet, what, what would it look like? So what the, the APC did was to hold uh, a workshop in 2014 and we took part to, uh, in that workshop as a member of the APC. Um, and we, we, the workshop was called Imagine a Feminist Internet. So if you're a feminist, what would you want a, an internet to be? How would it look like for you? So what we did was to, uh, there were um, women, I think the first one was uh, a gathering of more than 50 women who discussed different issues related to them, affecting them, um, and the, the women who were there were uh, coming from different countries all over the world. So. In 2015, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 2014, if I'm not mistaken, I think 
there were only 15 principals, but the following year, 2015, there was another workshop that was held and, and um, the, the, the initial list, the, the initial draft of the principal further developed. So um, currently, um, the, the principles, the feminist principles of the internet has 17, it has 17 principles divided into five clusters uh, that would include access, uh, movements, movement building, uh, expressions, the economy, and embodiment. And then what, what I like about this, this principle is that it is it, a living document. Uh, we continue to develop it, we continue to spread the word about it, encourage uh, different, different groups, women's groups, uh, sexual rights activist groups, to discuss it among themselves and to see if the principle works for them. Because for, I know that, for instance, in the Philippines, some of, uh, some of the groups we talk to do not agree with some of the principles, but it is at least a basis that they are provided with a framework on how to realize their dreams, um, realize their rights on the internet. So I think I would stop. Sorry for the lengthy time. Thank you very much. And Primavera, do you like to follow? Um, hi, everyone. So, yeah, I, I was asked to, um, to talk a little bit about how blockchain technologies could, to some extent, support uh, human rights. And um, to some extent, I feel the obligation to expand a little bit the scope of my uh, talk to also try and, uh, to some extent, demystify um, all the kind of promises that uh, comes along with blockchain technology. So I have um, categorized the various promises into six categories, and for each one of them, I'm going to say, like, to which extent te blockchain technology can actually help and to which extent they cannot. Um, so the first one is obviously like with regard to banking the unbanked, so by providing cryptocurrency accounts to people. Um, we have, uh, for instance, one example where the UN World Food Program has actually provided uh, about 10,000 Syrian refugees with some cryptocurrency-based uh, uh, voucher that could then be redeemed towards some kind of um, merchant that will actually recognize those. Um, so, and this is obviously um, made a lot of like noise and um, like PR. Now the question is of course, um, was, was it necessary to actually use a blockchain for that? Uh, could you not just use for instance uh, just a redeem code without really having to record everything on a blockchain through a cryptocurrency? Uh, there is of course also the issues of the fact that while well, refugees oftentimes do not really have access to a digital device or actually have to share the digital device between each other. Uh, and then the problem of transparency because since we, we are using like a, an actual public blockchain in which all the transactions are publicly accessible by everyone, then it of course becomes possible without even need to engage into any type of surveillance to actually see exactly uh, what each person, each refugee is actually doing with the money. Um, so in terms of then wh what is what is then the blockchain could help you know, with this regard then is um, in my view at least in the field of remittances uh, in the sense that today it's it's not really about like banking the bank but it's more about how do we make sure that people can transfer funds from one place to the other without having to uh, rely on those traditional intermediaries like Western Union or uh, whoever else that it takes in, takes a big commission on the funds that are being transferred as well as usually takes like at least a few days or perhaps even one week. Um, but the problem in the end is really about the interface because as long as we don't have actual merchants and actual actors that are accepting cryptocurrencies, then once we transfer or once we provide cryptocurrency account to people, then it, the, the question remains as to how are they gonna convert this cryptocurrency into actual fiat currency in order to engage into the local economy. Uh, the second one is the question of digital identity. And there is again a lot of discussion going on around the question of providing uh, self-sovereign identities for refugees, for migrants, and so forth. Um, again, this has quite a few problems. Uh, one is because either the, the concept is about providing some kind of um, private key which is based on the biometrics of those individuals, which means that to the extent that the biometrics can be compromised because it's actually possible to to, to take those information, then the private key is itself compromised. So this is um, one important problem. The other problem is if we actually just provide a particular account based 
on biometrics or other things, then there needs to be constantly a centralized identity service provider in order to ensure that every identity that is given to those individuals is a singular identity, that people are not collecting more than one identity. Um, and then again, this means that there needs to be this central repository, and even if we claim that this is a self-sovereign identity, in the end there is uh, one actor that is controlling who actually gets the identity and that can follow all the activity that are done through these identities. Um, so what is the blockchain useful then in this sense if it is not necessarily the best solution for self-sovereign identity? It's more about the question of credential management and attestations and actually providing the possibility of certifying specific skill set or specific attributes of a person in a way that those attributes can follow them from one platform to the other without having all the time to go back to this centralized uh, operator or this singular identity, uh, identity provider that is providing all those certifications. Um, the third one is about privacy, so whether or not blockchain technology can actually uh, contribute to the protection of personal data. Uh, this is obviously quite a controversial question in the sense that recording any types of personal data on a blockchain, which is by, by design a transparent thing so that everyone that can access the blockchain can have access to the data can be a problem, even if the data is actually uh, cryptographically uh, like encrypted on, on the blockchain, then if I get the, the key for decryption, then I can access this data and because the, the blockchain itself is tamper resistant and cannot be, uh, the data cannot be deleted, then I cannot remove the data once it has been stored. Um, so again, in this case, the, the, the question then is what, 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 to which extent blockchain technology could help in terms of privacy and data protection. And here again, I think we should focus more on the question of access control. So using a blockchain not as a means to actually provide any type of self-sovereign identity or self-sovereign data, but rather as a mechanism to um, provide permissions and privilege to people through this blockchain-based infrastructure and then using the blockchain to verify whether someone can actually uh, has the right to access this infrastructure. Um, as well as, uh, for instance, in the context of uh, proof of existence. So it's not about recording the data on the blockchain, but proving the existence of a particular document without really disclosing anything about the document, but in such a way is that the person can then self-store or just store the data somewhere else and then through the blockchain prove that the document that they are showing is actually authentic and has been issued by a particular authority. So this is, for instance, in the case of medical records or in the case of diplomas or any kind of accreditation to a person. Um, and then uh, we have the question about the supply chain and how blockchain technology could actually promote transparency, uh, could uh, promote more fair trading, equitable trading, uh, perhaps even um, help against like the use of slave, slave labor and things like this. And so we have some examples, uh, most notably in the fishing industry, uh, where for instance, like you have people that are oftentimes treated like put on a boat and working in like very harsh conditions, um, or in the case of, for instance, conflict diamonds or bl blood diamonds, uh, which are actually mined in like zone of war in order to actually sustain the operation of like military um, actions. And so in this case, the blockchain can actually be used in order to record the provenance um, and all the steps through which those projects have gone through so that every actor that is actually participating within the supply chain will declare that this has been done through a particular process or that this comes from a particular location. And then of course we cannot really prevent those actors from lying, but at least because of the non-repudiability that is inherent into the blockchain system, then if an actor were to lie, then it is possible if a posteriori we identify that something actually has gone wrong, we can see back through the supply chain who is the actor that has actually uh, provided some falsehood into the blockchain. Um, and then finally, uh, with regard to voting and uh, democracy, this is the last one. So um, again, there is like some discussions around the idea that blockchain technology could actually promote a more democratic system by actually recording vote, votes in a way that is tamper resistant, incorruptible and so forth. And again, here the problem is that voting is actually quite a, a very specific thing that requires some guarantees. Uh, one important guarantee is obviously the, the verifiability, so being able to see that 
the votes that I have done is actually being counted into the ballot. The other one is the incorruptibility or the inability to actually be bribed, which impl implies some system of secrecy. And so, again, there is a, look, for every type of recording a particular vote that actually does not require this kind of secrecy, then a blockchain-based system can be extremely useful. But whenever we want to combine both verifiability and secrecy, then it becomes much more complex. And uh, even if there is like some theoretical solution by which we can use some form of uh, uh, specific encryption and so forth in order to ensure that there is both secrecy and verifiability, we are still um, very far away to actually being able to implement this system. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. So many things that we can discuss um, about. Um, now, Nick, I'd like to ask you to say something. Thank you. I'm going to um, change tack slightly a little bit to come back to the constitutionalization um, component of this, uh, of this talk. Um, and really go backwards a little bit to think about what constitutions do and how they're designed to protect rights. And so we see, you know, a constitution ultimately does a couple of things but um, for, for these purposes the most important thing it does is it puts limits on how governments and the people who are able to um, exercise power over us have, have to exercise that power. It includes um, both procedural uh, components and due process and safeguards about how rules are made and enforced and it includes substantive rights um, that limit the actual content of those rules. At the same time, in parallel, we've got the uh, human rights system that does the same thing against states, that there are most particularly some universal values that we think inhere in all people, and we try to hold states primarily accountable uh, for making sure that they protect those fundamental human rights. Now, so those models of regulation um, as they evolved over the, uh, over the centuries, really put a lot of emphasis on states. And the challenge I think that we have in front of us today is that a lot of regulation is not done by states. Regulation, um, or, or states are just one actor among many in uh, the work of regulating how we live our lives. The, um, we're here at the IGF, so a lot of the work of technology developers, of firms, of companies, a lot of the work that is in embedded, the rules and the processes that are embedded in the software code, in the architecture of the internet, of the policies of platforms and the processes through which they're enforced, of the terms of service, of con um, uh, contracts, and so on. So the question then is, how do we protect fundamental rights in an, era, in an era when governance itself is fundamentally decentralized. And it gets even more complicated when we're talking about even more decentralized technologies uh, like blockchain solutions and smart contract where you are explicitly trying to uh, cut out the e existing intermediaries often, uh, the institutions that we have learned how to regulate. So there's a fundamental regulatory problem for the public interest, for those of us who care about the public interest, um, and for those of us who care about fundamental rights, to think about what are the processes that we need to put in place in the future to ensure that those rights are protected. And so this is what I mean when I talk about digital constitutionalism. This need, pressing need right now to rethink how we do the functions of constitutionalism without necessarily the focus on the state that has been historically at the core of constitutionalism. And the state, um, you know, that, that traditional view of constitutionalism doesn't really work if you, if you care about things like due process, uh, at the scale of the sorts of things we're talking about, the scale of decisions, the scale of, um, of content that we are regulating the difficulty with which public regulators have of trying to get to grips and uh, enforce public norms, we can't, can no longer rely wholly on a top-down model of regulation that is designed to protect the public interest and to promote fundamental rights. Okay, so I think regulation is obviously a big component. You know, public law is a big component of how we protect 
fundamental rights, but it can't be the only um, strategy. And so what I really want to think about today and um, just talk about briefly is how can we imagine a more decentralized approach to holding the exercise of power accountable? And particularly um, today thinking about um, internet regulation and, and content moderation and the sorts of issues that we've been talking about at the IGF particularly. Um, there is a pressing need, I suggest, for a lot of coalition building and a lot of innovation, regulatory innovation, to figure out how you promote and protect human rights and substantive freedoms uh, in a decentralized environment. And so I think this requires, and again, I'm going to use the word multi-stakeholderism because I really do believe that it requires a fundamental change in the way that we do regulation to involve a much broader array of um, in interest groups and stakeholders. Particularly, you know, we've been talking a lot about things like um, transparency and uh, trying to understand how many of these systems work and in whose interests uh, they are often deployed. And I think transparency on its own is not really enough. Um, there's, been, there's been a really interesting um, post that just came out, a big open letter signed by 70 civil society groups, uh, came out a couple of hours ago attached to the Santa Clara principles, that uh, really makes a key set of targeted demands for the sorts of um, due process safeguards and governance safeguards that we might want to see from private actors and particularly from digital platforms. And I think this is a really important step forward in particularizing exactly what we're going to need to be able to promote human rights in a decentralized internet environment. And so just to wrap up then, what I see as some of the most important opportunities here uh, the sort of coalition building that we can do with the broad range of stakeholders in this room. It's, if you recognize that the state is not going to solve a lot of these challenges on its own, then we need to involve a much broader group of stakeholders. I think that means um, doing more than transparency, although transparency is important, but being able to understand a lot of these technical systems at scale requires well, from the academics like myself, new methodological innovation that can try to uh, work out the effects and the impacts of social technical systems at a very large scale. But then the NGOs who are doing the really crucial work of working through on a day-to-day -day basis to try to raise public awareness and to, um, have to um, start a more sophisticated conversation about exactly whose responsibility is it to protect rights in particular circumstances. Um, the developers particularly, the, we, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity to invest in the development of tools that promote autonomy and public interest and uh, human rights values by design. Some of the things that Primavera was discussing, I think that there is a real key opportunity here um, for us to think carefully in the design phase and the procurement phase of a lot of the uh, a lot of the systems that we are building to ensure that protection and promotion of human rights is built in at the core of these issues. A lot of these conversations are ongoing, but I fear my big fear is that they're a little bit um, disconnected. And so, if I have a hope for digital constitutionalism as a project is that we can bring together all of the work that's happening, the, the huge amount of work that's happening in a lot of different communities to try to promote the public interest and protect fundamental rights together into some sort of unified or at least coherent um, intervention at different levels that enables us to embed protection and promotion of human rights into the software, into the, into the code, into the architecture, but also then into the monitoring apparatus of NGOs, into the work of academics and into the targeted regulatory work of public regulators. Um, I'd be, yeah, happy to follow up on, in, the, in the conversation, but I think th that's the hard work in front of us right now. Thank you very much for this fantastic um, um, call to action. Um, now next is Andrea.
Thank you. And good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. And um, <coughs> let, let's see how I can jump in from, from my experience at ICANN. So uh, I work for ICANN. I guess most of you know what ICANN is. If you don't, uh, I'll probably spend 30 seconds on explaining what ICANN is. And it's, it's the organization that does coordinate the unique system, unique identifiers for the internet. So we make sure that when you open up a computer or a mobile phone and you want to reach a, mo a, a, a page or you want to send a message or an email, well, the system knows where to uh, distribute these um, zeros and one, these, uh, these packets with information, and they do that using this unique system. So in a completely decentralized internet, there is one thing that is fully centralized, and is the distribution of names, numbers, and protocols. And um, while I was listening to you, and since um, um, ICANN has been undergoing through a process of rewriting its own constitution, I went and I did some tests here. And I went to see the original documents that in ICANN is called bylaws. Uh, it dates actually the 6th November of 1998, exactly 20 years ago. And the document, so I don't know how, how many of you remember in 1998, but there was a time when Google was founded, and if you look online, you see the web page of Google, you, you may feel yourself suddenly quite old. That's how I felt when I went to check this real thing. But there were around 150 million of internet users around the globe. And the ICANN constitution, the ICANN bylaws, was 22 pages long and about 8,000 words, according to Microsoft Word, word count. <laughs> and now, ICANN has been going through, as I was saying, a process of rewriting this constitution, and there was no mention of human rights in the original one. So you can, if you want, you can guess how many pages is the new constitution long, and how many words? Well, it's, it grew tenfold. Now it's 200 pages, and it's 80,000 words. And in the meantime, we also moved from 150 million internet users to 4.2 billion internet users estimate. So you may ask why ICANN is doing this constitution rewriting. Well, um, it gets longer here and more complex, but just to put it very simply, uh, back in 1998, internet was still seen as another technology. Um, we didn't have iPhones. We had GSM communication. It was seen as another way to speak to each other and to connect and to open up a blog, something like that. Suddenly, internet, 20 years after, is it's a part of our everyday life, from our economic uh, life to our rights, to our um, personal and more intimate spheres of life. And the interest and attention on how ICANN works and, and how the internet works, actually on how the internet works, led the global attention on uh, who's in charge of all of that. And in a completely decentralized internet, probably there is one organization that was supposed to be in charge, and that was, uh, that was deemed to be ICANN. Funny enough, 1998 is also, is also the great grandfather of this forum, of the IGF. Around this time is when the United Nations were looking at whether we needed a global summit to tackle the issues brought by this new technology. And, and, um, and the creation of ICANN back then was also linked to this environment. Okay, do we need new rules? Do we need to um, set uh, um, uh, UN organization to coordinate how this technology works and who, who benefits and who doesn't and who takes the decision? Well, the internet uh, made things more interesting and more complicated than that. And, um, and for many years, ICANN has been living with these uh, challenges of sticking to this remit, but recognizing that the world changed. And uh, so much so that back in 2012, 2013, the global pressure on, on the internet, I think it's similar to what we have seen just this week, was high enough. Many of you may remember um, the Snowden revelations. You may remember how the technical community came together in a, in, a, in a statement called the Multivideo Statement, where they recognized that 
there was some lack of trust uh, on the internet and the technical organization that, that underpinned this beautiful technology that we all use needed to do something to do to step up and they did that and one clear step that was taken was the decision by, by the US government to let this organization rewrite its own constitution and also rewrite its own legitimacy, another key word for a constitution, um, through that so far was guaranteed by a contract between the organization and the US government. So to rewrite this contract and to rewrite the, the, the rules, the bylaws, the constitution. And ICANN did that in a multi-stakeholder fashion, uh, gathering a discussion open to everybody to rewrite its own rules, its own governing rules, and also to substitute the role of this one single government on, on who is responsible for, who is taking the, the, the final word on that. And long story short, since my time is over, is over uh, the decision was taken that no other country, no other group of countries, no single group of stakeholders will be in charge of that, but all the stakeholders together through these 200 pages long constitution. I think that so far this is the most advanced example of a global constitution for, uh, for a technology like the internet, which is, wasn't meant to be constitutionalized by default as a decentralized network. And I think is an example that we can discuss further on how we can address some of the issues that are on top of this technology, so the applications, the uses that we do of the internet that impacts our life and human rights. And by the way, 20 years after, human rights are within the new ICANN bylaws, um, uh, although in within its limited scope, but they are, they are a key part of the core values, along with public interest and providing a service for the world. So thank you, I hope it was helpful. Yes, thank you very much indeed um, for very different and very interesting contributions. And right on time, uh, <laughs> we have the next panelist, Guberga um, of UNESCO. And we'll give him just a, a minute to settle in. Um, uh, all the other participants of the panel have just given about a six minute uh, contribution about what they uh, you know, consider important with regard to the topic of the uh, of this um, workshop. Do you want to jump right in or do you wait a little, wait a little yeah, bit? Okay. No worries, I, I imagine, I imagine. So we'll just uh, um, have you a little bit later. Um, right now we'd like to um, open the, the floor, obviously. We had four contributions already that I think will evoke some, uh, some discussion here in the room and remotely. And uh, I see already uh, some hands up here. We'd like to first move to the remote the, well, we'll, we'll go here <laughs> in the room. Um, we hope that we get some remote questions and comments later on. Um, who has a question or a comment? Please be concise and not too long. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Firdausi. Uh, well, the idea of uh, decentralized, this is good, uh, but uh, Maybe you, c you should distinguish with, uh, I think the question I should trace to the, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the professor. Andrea, no, no the other no, guy. I also I'm have a with professor. you. I also with have a question with you, but uh, yeah, please. Uh, in our history of humanity, uh, democracy is always represented uh, by some representative. So how do we involve uh, as many as people as we or uh, as we want to have when our population is growing in expon exponential way do you think it is while the idea is idealistic but when we implement it do you think it's actually uh, we will just uh, creating slower process to get uh, actually effective uh, result and then accurate because uh, maybe in the future, the idea is maybe we can just rely on the machine to do that work for us, not because of we are lazy, but maybe because of the complexity of humanity. What do you think about it? And then about the blockchain, 
if my question is uh, in regarding with the cryptocurrency to be accepted, do you think this is uh, the lack of the environment to accept the uh, cryptocurrencies because the lack of the uh, involvement of the government, for example, to create the, their own cryptocurrency? Because as we all know, in, in our uh, currency usually is produced by the government, whatever the government ca the country come from. But uh, what I understand so far, it is the idea from the cryptocurrency is not from the government. Uh, at least like Bitcoin and so on is not made by, for example, from the US or from European country and so on. And also uh, in regard about how to be accepted, the concept of blockchain and so on, how do you see the spread uh, awareness of the concept of blockchain because we often get the hype of how good the technology and so on but then later when it's being implemented actually it's more like rather than uh, closing the gap more than creating uh, more gap because as we if I refer to the Oxfam uh, research on last year that actually uh, globalization makes and including digital economy rather than making people uh, have more chance to be uh, like the poor and the riches is closer but actually it's still as big as uh, we found before so maybe this is it for now thank you thank you very much um, what we're going to do is we collect all kinds of comments and questions and please also do if you want comment on each other um, the speakers on the panel will have another chance to uh, to react in the in the end yes I forgot the icon face <laughs> Uh, well, you can ask later. I'm trying okay. to get some other people on board right now. Um, other questions and comments? See one over there, the lady in the very back. Oh, whoever of you wants to start. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, to make it short, uh, I think many people around here and other like events like this uh, start to have a good idea of like the dangers. Uh, of, of uh, free internet in general and the necessity for regulations, but still uh, we don't know much about uh, questions about like privacy. What are the limits where, uh, what consensus we might uh, find? Uh, and therefore I'm wondering if any of the panel or anybody here have uh, ideas for like first principles that might help to um, build uh, such constitution. Thank you. Other questions? Um, now the, the lady in the very back and then you over there. So some of the promise around blockchain technology is private or using private ordering to improve um, humanitarian goals, right, to protect fundamental rights. So I wonder if it stands at all in dichotomy to this idea of constitutionalization and whether, I mean, are, can they converge and work together in some way or are, are they at opposite spectrums, ends of the spectrum? Hi, I'm um, involved in a, an experimental project to actually build a decentralized network that uh, tries to preserve freedom of expression, but also discourage things like Nazis. And when I uh, go to uh, people who would be best qualified to, to answer these questions about predictive market voting and uh, moderation by communities and things like that, a lot of the, uh, the answer is, I have a blockchain allergy because the community as it stands right now is people who perhaps don't believe in moderating networks at all. Or they're politically, they're, they're fine with, with being right wing. Um, where is the work being done and how do we bridge the gap between these highly technical communities and the people who care about human rights online, particularly for marginalized populations? Thank you. Further comments and questions? Over here. Thank you. So uh, my question is regarding blockchain governance and existing structures often result in plutocracies. So do you know any strategies how we can uh, avoid that? Anyone else at this stage? Or may I ask Gui to maybe deliver his comment at this stage? On Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, I'm Guy Berger. I work at UNESCO, so welcome to this building. 
And I apologize, I'm late. I ended up with a double booking, so I, I just finished another session. So uh, my intervention is less about the technology of blockchain, but more about this question of digital, decentralized digital constitutionalism. Um, and I think then the question of technology uh, can be enablers or not enablers, as the case may be, but they come within that, that bigger context. And of course, as Wolfgang uh, has often pointed out, you, the paradox of the internet is that, uh, you know, it's a it's an international organization, a, in a, a international phenomenon in the age of, of still the Westphalian state. So um, despite the fact that many people thought the states were going away, uh, uh, John Perry Barlow, for, for example, uh, it's quite clear that they are not going away. If, if anything, states are becoming more assertive about these questions. And so this, this issue of um, constitutions at the national level or at the regional level is becoming more important. Uh, certainly an international level of constitutionalism looks like it's uh, in any more formal uh, shape is, 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 is not on the agenda uh, at all. But I do think that norms, of course, are important and norms do impact on the kind of constitutionalism that does exist because norms can constrain power uh, and norms shape laws and norms guide behaviors. So uh, at UNESCO, what uh, we've done in the face of this situation of the international and the national and the regional is to come up with an attempt to map internet experiences at national level. Now there may be a paradox in that because of course we're speaking about something that's far more than, than national. But the increasingly one is seeing the state at national level or in its regional uh, articulations uh, impacting on the national experience or the regional experience of the internet. Uh, I mean you all know the examples. So with this in mind, if indeed this is a scenario that states are going to become more and more uh, impactful, how can one uh, uh, try to have good constitutionalism rather than uh, you know, bad constitution and in the end a fragmented internet or an internet that's uh, abused to violate human rights uh, by, by a range of actors. So what UNESCO has, uh, and this is the session I just came from, We've come with a set of indicators which were developed over a, y a year and a half consultation, uh, including uh, comments from 2,000 experts and uh, 70 member states and so on. So these are quite you know, well-developed uh, uh, indicators about how you can map the situation of the internet at country level and then make recommendations that could strengthen the role of the internet in regard to four principles that UNESCO member states agreed. So these four principles are rights, openness, accessibility, multi-stakeholder participation, which is R-O-A-M, uh, rights, uh, you know, so it's easy to remember, rights, openness, accessibility, multi-stakeholder participation. The importance of these as normative principles is that it means you, if you're looking at the question of rights and trying to balance the right to life and security with the right to privacy or freedom of expression and the right to dignity, if you're balancing all these rights, of course, there's a classic rights test about necessity, proportionality, and so on. But what's important about this UNESCO perspective is to say, yes, the traditional test is key, but remember, this is happening in regard to the internet. And on the internet, openness is absolutely critical, because you don't have an internet, you don't have openness, technical openness, open source software, open economies, open opportunities, uh, and indeed open data and open government. And indeed, when you're doing this balancing, you also have to look at accessibility because it doesn't help to you know, create a, a rights respecting internet if people don't have access to it and if people don't understand their rights and if it's not catering to language and, and, and uh, marginalized groups and so on. So that's ROA. Then of course the M is multi-stakeholder because the way that you're going to try and get this kind of uh, nuanced balancing of rights with regard to not damaging openness or accessibility is through multi-stakeholder participation. So to give you a very kind of short example, um, increasingly you find governments, there's some kind of crisis and they cut internet access or at least platform access. And you know, they, they say, well, this is what we're trying to do to stop incitement to violence and there's people being killed. So what they're doing there is they're balancing rights, but they're not thinking what does this mean for accessibility and what does this mean for openness and aren't there other alternatives 
that can try and keep intact an internet because it's very easy to deal with problems like incitement to violence on the internet. You just kill the internet. <laughs> but the idea of this model is to try and keep the internet because you need to keep you know, rights, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder. And if you don't keep uh, rights, what's the point of the internet anyway? I mean, so you, it's, a, it's a package of elements. So with these indicators, it's a way to take this thing and assess in a given country, okay, let's look at the way internet companies are setting community standards. Do they do it in a multi-stakeholder way? Or do they do it, it's their power and they make unilateral decisions? When governments are making decisions on what they'll do in the event of crisis or what they'll do with intellectual property, do they do it in a multi-stakeholder way? So I think that this mapping that we want to do, which can look at the, all these axes and see where there's shortfalls, these can lead to really uh, powerful policy recommendations to improve practice about balancing rights, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder performance. And I would just end by saying, um, we did a, a very interesting publication at UNESCO, and I've got a bag full here, called What If We All Governed the Internet? Which is a bit provocative a title, but uh, anyway, what if we all governed the internet? And uh, we got a lot of uh, input, in fact, from Philip Reviewer over here, from Mauro Santinello, uh, about digital constitutionalism. And so what we try and do in this, in this publication is also try and reconcile all this thinking about, well, you know, when does multi-stakeholderism begin to impact on a digital constitutional vision, because it doesn't necessarily do that. Because if you're speaking about ultimately digital constitutionalism being about political rights and the state as either a key violator or a key protector of human rights, this, these are important. And at the end, I would just say this, that while there's indicators, I think there's 250 indicators with uh, 70 core indicators, Perhaps the most important indicators, certainly from the piloting we've done and the free testing, which is in countries like Nigeria, Thailand, Paraguay, uh, uh, Brazil, um, I can't remember offhand the other ones, but from this experience we've done, the most important research we've found is not simply the rights, nor the openness, nor the access, but it's the multi-stakeholder. That's the most powerful uh, set of findings that we've found, and then we've revised the indicators to be more powerful in that regard. So I think that uh, to come with research, uh, hopefully with this UNESCO endorsed indicator instrument, which next week the member states here will decide if they give it a stamp of approval or not. But if you do that, you come with the indicators, you get evidence-based assessments of internet at the national level and good recommendations, et voila. So I invite people to have a look at these uh, internet indicators. And if you're interested, contact us at UNESCO and maybe we can put you in touch with others, create a multi-stakeholder steering committee to do an internet assessment in your country, no matter whether your country is you know, mid-level, developed, developing, whatever. Um, these indicators are universal indicators. And of course you interpret them for your situation. But I think this can help creating that context, particularly a normative context, but also impact on regulation and technology about digital constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we come to a round of last comments by our panelists, uh, where they react to each other and also to, to you, I'd like to ask whether there are any, any more comments or questions at this point. Over there. So I'm Eduardo Celeste, University College Dublin. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a brief comment. So on the possibility to introduce in our debate the distinction between uh, fragmentation of general principles and fragmentation of particular norms. On the one end, we have the elaboration of particular norms related to digital rights, and we know that these norms are fragmented, and the examples of smart contracts is a, is a perfect example. And, but I think that this trend is in line with the global nature of the Internet, and uh, as not to be demonized, because the implementation of constitutional principles has always produced different results. What is worrisome at first in sight is the fragmentation of general principles. But my position is that the fragmentation of the general principles at this stage is not worrisome insofar uh, it will not last in the long term. Because the digital revolution is a, a relatively 
recent phenomenon and our legal systems are still adapting, elaborating, translating fundamental principles uh, which emerge in the context of state-centric constitutionalism uh, in the context of the digital society. Therefore, what we now call fragmentation of decentralization at the level of general principles uh, is not a negative factor, I think, because this tendency witnesses the complexity of digital society. And I conclude, uh, the complexity, this fragmentation, this inherent divergence that in the long term, uh, I think, could enhance the, the richness, the resistance, and the farsightedness of the principles uh, of digital constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask now whether there are any remote participants that have questions, not <laughs> at this time. Um, so I'd like to ask the uh, panelists in which order they prefer to um, react to the questions that that came up. Sorry, go ahead. Hmm? Yes, yes, uh, to, to react to the uh, comments and uh, um, questions and also to try to answer the question that we laid also out in the program, which is how can technical decentralization, including blockchain and decentralized digital rights advocacy lead to better human rights protection? Who wants to start? I try to summarize all the questions about blockchain. Um, I want to answer first the, the, the very important question about uh, to which extent does private ordering uh, and digital constitutionalism actually go together. And I think this is actually one of the core questions as to like what do we really mean when we mean digital constitutionalism? Um, because in the way in the way I can see it, it, it's really like we are in a situation in which we like the actors, whether it is because we have multinational corporations that are operating transnationally, whether it's because we have decentralized networks that are also operating transnationally, the question then becomes, this digital constitutionalism, does it, it's something that transcends the actual nation state and it's something that needs to actually involve some form of priva private ordering in the sense that we need those actors to come together and to decide to operate according to a particular set of principles, uh, which back in the past could remind us of like what has happened with like Lex Mercatoria. It's like when you actually have actors that are interacting outside of the jurisdiction of one particular state, then you create a new system of normativity and people agree to operate according to particular rules. Now when then we move on to the internet and we have Lex Informatica and we have Lex Cryptographica and however, however we want to call it, but the question then is because like when we talk about digital constitutionalism, aren't we actually talking about some form of private ordering, which is m a multi-stakeholder set of actors that decide to create a particular set of rules that they voluntarily decide to become, uh, to abide by. And, um, and on this point, I think it's, it's actually interesting to see how uh, actors are actually increasingly, at least in the blockchain space, but on the internet in general, uh, people are increasingly relying on this kind of contractual or technical means in order to actually uh, fill up a gap that actually exists because because national government cannot actually reach those particular platform because international laws are difficult to apply. And the problem is that of course, on the one hand, you can use this digital constitutionalism in order to ensure that human rights are actually protected where a government could not actually manage or where international law are, are, have, a, have a difficult ability to actually reach those actors. And so people agree to collectively abide by principle which is about an enforcing human rights. At the same time, it has the opposite effect, which means that because they are creating those technical and contractual means that operate actually into a separate uh, system of normativity, then it also becomes even harder now for a government to actually go and enforce those uh, um, human rights in case that there was an actual uh, violation. And then with regard to the question as to um, to which extent those government needs or have uh, been adopting or recognizing uh, blockchain technologies, I think that we can see again this kind of distinction between one is existing institutions actually adopting blockchain technologies in order to somehow transition towards a system that is more 
trust-fed or trustless, I don't know, it depends how you look at it, but basically providing technical guarantees in order to increase the transparency, the auditability, or the accountability of existing institutions. So if I start registering all my transactions on a blockchain, then I get this kind of like real-time audits that I cannot really tamper with and so forth. So existing institutions can decide to adopt those technology in order to increase the trust that they are actually providing to uh, the people they interact with. And then on the other hand, we have the use of like those more fully decentralized systems that are also adopting those, uh, those questions. And then this goes back to the question of governance. So when we actually have an existing institution, the use of blockchain technology is actually to some extent reducing the need of oversight, right, because you actually bake specific principle into a technological framework. The way in which you design the technology is, of course, designed by the institution itself, and so the governance is done via the institution, but then decides to bind itself to this technical, technological design. The, the other question is when we actually create fully decentralized systems, then the question of governance becomes extremely important, and if we do look today's pretty much most, if not all, of the blockchain-based networks or blockchain-based application because they have, they have been actually designing a particular governance structure which is actually based mostly on technological things, so the on-chain governance side, then obviously it's essentially done via plutocracy. And the problem, I think, is actually a, a logical one. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's inherent into the fact that if you do have a pseudonymous system, an open public blockchain, that does not actually incorporate within its own system a notion of identity, then by definition it's always going to be plutocratic. Because if you cannot, what, what does decentralization mean if you don't have the notion of identity that you can refer the concept of decentralization to? And so if you don't have a system which actually incorporates identity, a strong identity system, then by definition it's always going to be based on resources or, or tokens or whatever it is that you use as a proxy to identity, but obviously because it's not an actual identity as to one person, one vote, then it, it necessarily leads into plutocracy. And so, and that's where I think we, and there is some thinking that is slowly, progressively going on in this field is that because the system, if we want the system to maintain its uh, prerogative of being an open public and pseudonymous blockchain, then governance needs to happen off chain because that's the only place in which we actually have identities, and that's the only place in which we can actually create a system of governance that does not depend on, that does not depend on resources which will lead to plutocracy. And this is, so, I think, personally, this is my own personal, I think this is an inherent problem, because as long, and if we do introduce identity into a decentralized system, then you start having a centralized identity provider, which to some extent eliminates the, the what was the point of having a centralized technology if, if there's a centralized identity that, that, that controls every transaction. So I think most of the focus, when we are into an institutional framework, I think that there is actually many ways in which blockchain can actually help this transition towards a more trustless or trusted uh, infrastructure. When we are into a full decentralized network, we absolutely need to focus on the question of off-chain governance to avoid those problems. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to go on from here. So, so when we talk about this um, digital constitutionalism, most of most of the principles, the val the, the the declarations that are being developed, um, they were not state-led. Although recently we've seen that a lot of states are already getting involved in this because they're being left behind. So, and, and what is good about this is that w w when 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 this uh, non-state-led um, principles that are being developed. It's actually people, those who are concerned with our rights, who are leading the way, who are uh, providing the, the, the values, the principles that they think should be included, should be, um, you know, cherished. Uh, and, and these are something, these are things that are not really that uh, far um, removed from our traditional values, those that we, that are enshrined already in our constitutions, in the UDHR. We, we are just adapting this to the new challenges that uh, um, are emerging. Um, we know that uh, laws, we, we cannot always rely on laws because we know that laws are, cannot catch up with technology and technology so fast. But the thing is that, of course, um, we have to consider that um, there is also somehow a disconnect 
like like you have a group of uh, individuals, maybe technologists, human rights activists, who are who would put up um, this uh, proposal to have these principles, and yet you all, we also have to consider that there is also, there's this, a disconnect because a group of people might not even be familiar with what is actually happening, with that, that there is already technology and it is already impacting their rights. So it, the, um, there is a need for us as well to explain what, what, how, how technology is actually affecting our rights. Blockchain, for instance, it is something that is alien to to many people. Like in my country, like it's only maybe only half are con are connected, and they don't even know what what blockchain is and what it does for them. And there is, um, I, I remember that we we organized um, uh, a a. F a consultation with women about issues of rights and they were questioning us uh, issues of access sorry issues of access to the internet and they were questioning us you know in, in 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 my place we don't even have electricity we don't even have water and you're talking to us about all these internet rights about access about using technology and all that and uh, so it, it's also um, important that that we also try to bridge that that uh, gap, um, explain to them what, what technology can do, blockchain for instance, what it can, through, um, I think, uh, through examples on how it can really solve problems. For instance, we're, we've been thinking um, blockchain in terms of um, safeguarding the votes. Elections are coming up in many countries and we are thinking that it can be something uh, that would be useful. Like in my country, nobody loses an election. Uh, uh, one loses an election because the person has been cheated. So a blockchain technology might work. And, and that is something that is important to you know, explain to uh, the, the, the population, constituents. Thank you very much. Just a couple of quick points. Um, just to follow on, I, I guess I, I really want to echo Primavera's um, comment in, in, in relation to the question um, up here in the back right that um, is blockchain development at odds with digital constitutionalism? And I, I think fundamentally no. Um, blockchain development doesn't do away with governance uh, discussions at all. It just moves where those dis governance discussions have uh, happen. So how those values are baked into the uh, code and how they are resolved by the community who is responsible for maintaining and uh, for maintaining the code, they're constitutional questions. Um, they're not addressed by the old style of constitutionalism, but they're exactly the type of new style constitutional questions that we need to fundamentally um, deal with and we have to invent head on. Um, then the second point, in the middle here was, uh, I, if I'm looking at my notes, uh, how do we bridge the gap between tech communities and people who care about human rights and where is that work being done? And I, I'm hopeful that the answer is here. Um, here at the IGF, at RightsCon, at Internet Freedom <coughs> Festival, every day by organizations like Lisa's, uh, the, the NGOs who are working. But if it's not, if, if we feel that um, the, the IGF is not providing that mix that we really need, then we need to, I mean, let's, uh, let's take seriously um, Macron's statement last night about thinking about the future of the IGF to make sure that it tackles those questions head on because this is ideally the place where we have that multi-stakeholder group and if it's not working, we've got to fix that because we absolutely need that collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. So there was no particular question to Igor, but I just want to build on the last intervention and just give you some few points for reflection. Um, I mean, we, we, we do are at a, at a pivotal moment in the internet. Um, I was thinking even now, uh, the internet that we experience today is very different from the one of the late 90s and early 2000. It is fragmented and um, speaking about a global internet constitution or, or some forms of global norms and principles, 
it's becoming more and more challenging even to think about it. You know? So probably um, th this solution to preserve what we can for, for, uh, for the future, and, it's, and we have to act now, is to probably go into some small either topic or uh, regional specific focus and approach. And um, consider also another thing. Uh, within ICANN, when I, when I mentioned to you the, the whole process of rewriting the bylaws, um, we faced some major issues of you know, writing the constitution. The issues of participation. How do we ensure that you move to uh, bylaws that ensure that the DNS, the core resource that keeps the internet together, is done by you know all the users when the users are 4.2 billion, and you know it's impossible. And so, but the, the, the challenge is there. Um, the scalability of the processes that you use. Uh, we we do work with working groups, open, multi-stakeholder, um, and linked to that is the cost, the transition for us, and the re rewriting of the the bylaws costed us millions. It's lots of money. I mean, I think we never counted. If you put manpower, if you put all the air travels and the, all the cost of the meetings, it goes easily into you know, <laughs> tens of millions. And I can could do that because there's a system of self-financing and we had the reserve, but we burned most of our reserves to do that. So that's something that you cannot uh, um, um, leave aside. But is is indeed is upon us, and yeah, yesterday we heard from, from Macron approach, um, the line is either you do it or we do it. And we did it and we succeed at the DNS level, although it's not finished. The process actually within ICANN is still going on. But we haven't been able to succeed at the global level. We tried with Net Mundial, we came, we came around with some principles, but then when we wanted to move from principles to implement these principles, things start falling apart. My question is, is that a way to go forward? I mean, can we go back to a universal declaration of human rights today? Question mark. Can we go towards universal declaration of internet rights and freedoms and principles today? That is, that is you know, maybe we are trying to, maybe we haven't understand yet and I, I understand yet the nature of this technology and the internet, what we're talking about. And I'm completely blind about blockchain, which is, uh, you know, it goes even farther to that. So, I mean, it's good that this reflection is here, and I think this is the place to have this reflection, but it's also the place to um, realize that we have to act fast. And the need is there, and the classic approach, they fall in short more and more, and we need to innovate this, this, um, the, the governance side of things. Really my thoughts. Thank you. Anything to my right? Any other comments? Well, <laughs> I would echo Andrea that uh, it's really important that these issues are discussed here about the need to innovate for governance for these kind of questions and the need to consider the uh, endangered species of, of multi-stakeholder participation and to what extent it can be constitutionalized and to what extent technology like blockchain can play a role in that regard as opposed to technology like blockchain playing all kinds of other roles which uh, some may be positive and some may simply be destroying the planet because of the amount of computing power that may be involved. <laughs>
I'm happy to respond that, uh, you know, every uh, member state in the world has signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by being a member of the UN. And if you sign up to UNESCO, you sign up to free flow of information and to protecting culture and so on. Now, UNESCO's concept I was telling you about is ROAM, Rights, Openness, Accessibility to Multi-Stakeholder. And it goes under the chapeau, Internet Universality. And people have said, what does this mean? Is this like an American Internet for everybody? And it, Internet Universality doesn't mean that these principles are interpreted and applied the same way every single spot on earth. If you just take the right to dignity uh, versus violation of dignity through defamation, and defamation that's not justifiable, well, we know already between the US and Europe there are different concepts as to how do you limit and what do you limit? Wh you know, when is uh, uh, speech that violates a right to dignity or, or reputation, when is it uh, legitimate to limit it? Europe, uh, Anglophone tradition itself, you know, US and, and the UK, they're different. So the fact that you have universal principles and universal standards, and uh, in the case of these internet indicators, uh, universal doesn't exclude cultural diversity. But if things uh, actually step outside the bounds of um, the kind of international regime of human rights and the ICCPR, which sets the conditions for limitations, then, of course, that is, that is not uh, acceptable. But universality doesn't mean uniformity. It means that at world level, these things must be uh, dealt with uh, and uh, interpreted, and decisions have to be aligned. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, as I said, nobody would say that um, uh, the right to dignity or reputation is being uh, disrespected or violated because of the difference between the U UK and the US regimes on this. They both are legitimate interpretations of how you should this. So I think that uh, there's a lot of variation possible, but we also have to say uh, there are some parameters when, you know, deviation uh, becomes, you know, uh, I mean, there's a right not to be tortured, for example. You know, <laughs> that's pretty clear. Once you actually deviate from that, you're deviating from human rights standards. So there's no diversity allowed there, but all these other principles, freedom of expression and so on, they, they are interpreted uh, differently according to community standards within the limits. So uh, anyway, as regards China, <laughs> I don't comment very specifically on China, but certainly China is a member of the international community, and the Chinese authorities would be the first to say they, uh, whether you, you want to take it or not, but they say we, their standards are the same as the standards of other countries, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and ICCPR. So okay, now then you assess, is that really the case, or is it debatable here or there? But the standard remains the standard. And that then, you know, it's, it's not just a norm. These are uh, agreements by the international community. So it's not just a norm that you can take it or leave it. These are standards. And unless you want to deviate and leave the UN system, I'm sorry, those standards are, by, are what will be used to assess at what point you move beyond the bounds. Thank you. Uh, one very short comment here from one of our co-organizers, uh, Francesco Piro. Okay, good evening to everybody. <laughs> it's very late, um, but only a few words. Um, I am, uh, I have a technical skill, and um, for the happiness of Andrea, um, we are studying a new model to evaluate uh, possible uh, alternatives to the hierarchical structure of DNS. Um, it is uh, very far from uh, this topic, and at the beginning of this topic, uh, I thought uh, um, that uh, I have uh, many, ide many ideas, uh, very confused uh, about it. Uh, and after uh, this panel, uh, I have many ideas, but more confused uh, um, respect to the beginning. Uh, but uh, um, I thought that uh, um, there are good news. Uh, yesterday, uh, the French President uh, Macron launched the, the big initiatives uh, uh, call uh, for the peace 
Um, and then I think uh, it is very important uh, initiative. Italy signed it uh, immediately uh, with the other three countries. Um, and probably it, it could be a, a beginning to uh, transform uh, this situation, this confused situation. I don't know. Uh, but uh, China girl, uh, before, um, let me reflect about it. Uh, probably uh, she is right. Uh, um, and uh, I remember a wonderful song of uh, Italian, uh, Italian, uh, Italian song uh, that said, uh, how can a rock stop the sea? Um, it's a very famous uh, song, uh, and uh, I want to finish uh, with it. I don't try to 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 to, to, to sing to sing this because uh, it's not uh, in, it's not <laughs> in the, the, the right situation. But uh, if you heard it, uh, uh, you you understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we promise an There's one last question over there or comment, please. It's a little, it's a little bit of both. So uh, the panel has spoken in terms of constitutions and bylaws and standards and best practices, and sometimes those words evoke legal, their, their legal terms, which differ depending on your jurisdiction, the, their meaning, right? So in my jurisprudence in the United States, a constitution is something that protects individuals from too much regulation, right? So to hear um, comments that regulatory policy is a key part of building a constitution is confusing to me, right? It's hard for me to get my head around what a digital constitution looks like if that's what part of it, right? So I, the, the question is, are we hampering the discussion around what sounds like a very important topic by building in legal words that mean different things to different people based on where, where they live in a, in a multi-stakeholder environment? That's the question. That's a, it's an interesting question that we're going to have to take on, on notice a little bit. Um, except to say that that's a, that that's a particular, uh, it's a particularly American view of constitutionalism, I think, um, the, as, as the primary goal of restraint on the states. Uh, and I, I do think that we can, uh, we can also think about more positive roles for regulation. So particularly when we're talking about human rights and we're talking about the obligation not just to refrain from infringing on human rights, but to create the circumstances that enable people to enjoy their human rights. Those are positive duties um, that, uh, that are on, well, both states and other types of, uh, of governing bodies. Um, as to the terminological question, are we, make, are we confusing? I think we are, to an extent, um, using words that do create a lot of confusion. I, I take that criticism. I don't know how exactly to fix that within the two minutes that we have left uh, in the panel, but it's an interesting point. Thank you very much. And this is true. We um, promised an exploration of this topic, and I don't think we've come to any um, very clear conclusions, but I think we've thrown up some questions. And we perhaps the one c conclusion that we can draw is that blockchain technology will not in itself guarantee human rights. Um, but that there are some applications where this is very much relevant. Um, we will have to discuss the role of the state and the role of multi-stakeholderism, um, because that was a big question. And some say we, we need the state, we need the state as a central authority. Others say that perhaps multi-stakeholder uh, governance is the way to go. Um, and we also have this paradox that the more important the internet becomes in our society, the more important these kind of questions become. But at the same time, we heard that it's more and more difficult to actually have this process of talking about it and finding the kind of rules that suit everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming out. And if anybody would like a book, I have copies here.
Yes, yes, yes. 